The new normal requires new networking strategies to reopen, remobilize, and rebuild operations using human ingenuity, inspired creativity, and applied digital innovation. Join us for an exchanging of ideas and a showcase of strategies from our customers across multiple industries. Welcome to our live webinar, Establishing a New Normal in Retail, Critical Insights for IT Leaders. Thank you all for joining us today. In real time, we have seen retailers adjust their priorities regarding their modes of operation, methods of customer engagement, product on the shelf or virtual shelf, and look toward technology as a means to adapt to the changing landscape. Depending on the retailer, some experienced a sudden decline in demand, and others like pharmacies and grocery stores selling essential needs, experienced extreme spikes in demand, consequently impacting the overall supply chain. Our panelists today will offer their expertise and insights regarding the impact, digital maturity and acceleration, shaping retail of the future, and of course the IT considerations that enable a seamless transition toward agile operations, accommodating not only today's demand, but also equipped to adapt to tomorrow's. So a couple of items before we begin, all participants are in listening only mode, Please post your questions during the live session in the Q&A chat window below, and we'll allocate some time at the end to answer questions in real time, so be sure to stay tuned until the very end to hear your questions answered live. Joined today by Robert Eastman, Research Manager and Analyst from IDC, Mike Leibovitz, Senior Director of Product Management at Extreme Networks, and Sarah Neslin, GM of Retail Trans and Transportation and Logistics at Extreme Networks. Kicking us off first, Robert Eastman will share insights from the initial impact and in response to COVID to the midterm focus in retail. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for joining us today. Erica, thanks very much. And thank you to the Extreme Networks team. Uh, and it's great to be uh, with Mike and Sarah today and, and talking about, uh, about COVID-19 and the new normal. So I'll try and set the stage a little bit. Great. Well, you know, IDC has been uh, doing a series of surveys uh, around COVID-19 uh, as you can imagine, trying to sort of assess uh, what's, going, what's going on with retailers. And so uh, we've come up with a, a curve, uh, is what we call it, to try and just describe the phases of, that we think retailers are going through. And we actually asked uh, retailers, and this is really from um, two months ago, you'll notice at the bottom, two months ago when we asked retailers where they thought they were uh, in the phases of, um, of the COVID-19 crisis, 52% actually said that they'd made it all the way through to uh, the middle phase. And we call it the recession phase. I'm not sure if that's the best word for it, but that's where retailers told us they were at. And since then, we've actually surveyed them again. Uh, and, um, and we've actually seen a movement uh, from the middle phase uh, to the return to growth phase. So that really um, the most recent survey results were that uh, only 26.6% of retailers reported being in the middle phase and in uh, that phase four was up to 37.8%. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think what we're seeing though is a lot of uh, sort of changing conditions on the ground uh, in retail, if you will. So I think these results sort of bear watching. Uh, and I've put in those arrows at the, between uh, the recession and return to growth phase, because unfortunately, I do think we're seeing some movement back and forth. Um, we've always, uh, or we have been very eager uh, to see retailers opening up and. Uh, and I think, um, you know, we're seeing that, that that actually may change a little bit. So the significance of this is that, um, you know, with 52% of the retailers uh, reporting originally that they're in that middle phase, that really means that those retailers have been focusing on, on operational resiliency. And that means really uh, tactical focuses on bringing up new omnichannel services, um, you know, really thinking about the next normal, uh, obviously, we've seen retailers having to do a lot with, with contact lists and, and curbside delivery. Whereas uh, when we get into the next phase, um, there we think retailers are really thinking about moving from tactical to strategic, right? Uh, thinking about uh, revisiting their uh, digital transformation initiatives uh, and rethinking perhaps how they're going to rejigger their digital transformation focuses in, in order to really um, uh, return to growth. You know, so what is happening with retail, right? Um, and there's two charts here. Um, on the left chart, we're really looking at change, percent change in retail sales 
from the prior month. So this is from, uh, from May uh, to April or April to May. And then on the right side, you're seeing a chart, which is really the gross uh, uh, cumulative annual growth rate from January to May. So uh, what we're seeing now really over the past five months, looking at the chart on the right, is that uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, retailers that are in the, in, in seeing positive increases and some that were seeing uh, negative, negative growth, right? So we obviously have seen a large shift to, to e-commerce retail. Uh, and we know that essential businesses, a lot of those were uh, general merchandise and food and beverage and grocery, right? And so those, <laughs> some retailers have seen some really good growth and, and, um, and, and have seen you know, a lot of healthy conditions. And then down at the bottom, you can see a lot of retail categories that really have been struggling. Um, and if you look at the chart on, on the right, the prior month, uh, just the most recent month, um, the most recent reports from the Census Bureau, right? A lot of positives, right? There's been a, uh, some good results from retail. Obviously retail has been trying to open um, and uh, clothing accessories at the top, right? Huge growth because in the right-hand chart, right? They've just been, been hurt really badly. Uh, over the past three or four months. So now uh, a little bit of increase looks like a huge increase for, for clothing and accessories. So, uh, you know, the chart on the left looks very optimistic. Again, I think we're seeing some changing conditions on the ground. Uh, and um, at this point, uh, you know, it's difficult to say whether uh, that chart on the right is going to keep looking that way over the next several months. We can hope so, um, but it, it's really difficult to say. We have been saying that the global retail 2020 growth estimates are gonna be half what they were pre-COVID, right? When we've been saying that for several weeks now, um, you know, we have not changed that, but again, conditions are, are uncertain on the ground right now. Uh, uncertainty is the word of, of, the, of the times, unfortunately. And uh, so it really remains to be seen, uh, you know, through the rest of the year, what conditions um, on the ground, um, how they turn out. So uh, digital maturity and impact. We ask uh, retailers uh, continually really um, where they are with regard to digital transformation and DX is our shorthand uh, for digital transformation in case that confuses anybody. Uh, and so um, we are continually measuring uh, maturity of, of digital transformation. In this chart, we, in the, which comes from one of our COVID um, uh, surveys, we asked it a bit differently. And I think the significance of what you're seeing here is really that uh, if you look at those, the bottom two categories, what that tells you is that 45% of retailers are really approaching digital transformation on a tactical or, or local level, function or, or line of business focused, right? Um, there's only 35% really of retailers that are really treating digital transformation uh, as a long-term commitment and strategy. And I think this, you know, this is something to think about because retailers that came into the current crisis well along on digital transformation, fully committed to it, uh, making an enterprise-wide strategy, have been in a better position to really respond to conditions on the ground. And we've seen that. Um, you know, we've seen retailers um, that have uh, quite rapidly and, and agilely uh, set up curbside delivery, uh, set up dark stores in order to help with, uh, with fulfillment, with the, the changing um, e-commerce model that, that, that we've been seeing. Um, so they've been able to react and respond quite quickly. Other retailers have really struggled with this. Uh, I, I do know that uh, I recall hearing one retailer when asked about curbside delivery, uh, their response was, no, no, we would never do that. That would take us weeks or months to set up. Uh, and so we're going to pay attention to our employees instead. Right, and whereas other retailers have obviously been a little bit more successful at that, so this is a, I think, just a, a something that, that really bears some thinking about. Uh, and I think what we're going to see uh, coming out of COVID nineteen, the leaders will be doubling down on digital transformation. Perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, and I think the the retailers that um, have been treating it more tactically uh, and um, and locally within their enterprises. Uh, you know, may find that they need to make, give it a more serious uh, a commitment. So uh, what does this mean for digital acceleration and, and adaptability and, and innovation, scalability? 
Uh, perhaps most importantly, what does it mean for agility and resiliency? We asked uh, retailers um, uh, what challenges uh, um, or, or what they would have to do to address the challenges of the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, not surprisingly, right, business operations resiliency at the top, um, that's, that shouldn't be too surprising. The customer experience is always a focus. And I apologize that some of these, uh, that some of the descriptions get truncated. That third one down is really connectivity programs to connect workforce, operations, and partners, right? Um, we know that networks are the nerve center uh, of, the, of the retailer. It, it really is a piece of infrastructure that underlies everything the enterprise has to do. Um, and so that's a, a key piece of infrastructure that really um, retailers need to continually think about upgrading and, and, and making future ready. Um, the next one, the software development capabilities, uh, that is really software development capabilities to drive product experience and, and innovation. Um, uh, and then uh, two other sort of key um, takeaways, I think, from this slide are, one, digital trust programs, which is security, uh, is further down the list. And I think it's important not to misinterpret that. Every time we ask retailers about uh, where security is uh, in terms of driving their digital transformation initiatives, security is always uh, number one and number two. It's right up there with network infrastructure and security and cybersecurity are, are, are right behind that all the time. So here I think it's lower on the list just because of more urgent priorities. But, uh, it, but cybersecurity is very important. The other takeaway I take from this slide is that digital infrastructure resiliency programs much lower on the list than business operations resiliency. And when we've, looked, when we've looked at the ability of retailers to respond in this crisis, um, I think that um, there needs to be a close linking between digital infrastructure resiliency and business operations resiliency. So as retailers are thinking about the business ops resiliency, this requires a, a digital transformation foundation, if you will. Um, and there's a number of things in that uh, that we really call um, retail next-gen infrastructure. So um, I think those need to be more closely linked. Uh, and I think that that is key to responding to a crisis uh, like we're seeing right now. So midterm focus uh, for retailers. Uh, uh, to me, this um, falls into, into these five buckets. Um, acceleration of the, of the retail digital transformation. Uh, retailers do need to double down on, on digital transformation. And we'll see the leaders do that. We'll also see the digital natives do that. Um, as we've seen before the COVID-19 crisis, right? It's the middle class of retail that has struggled. Uh, and I think we're seeing that amplified uh, in the current crisis. Experiential retail uh, for better customer experience. Um, our, our sense and the way we state it in our research is that the mission of, of retail is really the experiential retail mission. Uh, and, and so that's always top of mind. Uh, it's become even more uh, critical now. Uh, and as a crisis has force shifted cu cu customers to behave differently, um, that means that retailers, uh, excuse me, re yeah, retailers need to be agile in changing how they respond to a changing uh, customer experience. Uh, agile, agile response. Um, you know, agility is always important. Um, I think agility often has a little bit of, a, of an IT uh, context to it. And I think what we're seeing in this crisis is that agility um, very much has a business ops focus to it, right? Um, retailers needed to change what they were doing, needed to change their business models. We've seen restaurants sell groceries. Uh, we've seen uh, retailers sell, you know, uh, sell face masks. We've seen manufacturers change their operations over to um, uh, manufacturing face masks. So um, there's just a lot of agility that's needed, right? Um, you know, one example, and I don't know if others have seen this case study, the HEB uh, case study that came out in a, um, in a publication maybe a, a couple of months ago, uh, and it really sort of talked about how agile HEB was uh, coming into this crisis. They had actually uh, taken their lessons learned from the MERS and SARS crisis before, uh, and so HEB was very quick to be able to set up a nerve center. Um, to put together an emergency operations team, to move inventory around the country. Um, and, um, 
And, and so that sort of agility gets built into an enterprise and becomes even more important at, during a crisis like this. Uh, and then um, uh, acceleration of global multi-source supply chain, right? Uh, supply chains have been disrupted uh, and nothing will, uh, will uh, uh, highlight your need to develop multiple sources uh, like a crisis like this. And so uh, certainly there are a lot of retailers that are looking at that and saying, uh, what do we do differently next time? And then really, um, uh, next generation retail and infrastructure, right, is something that I talk about a lot. Um, and we're, we're, we're doing a lot of research on this and publishing, publishing a lot of research around what is next gen retail infrastructure and how important is it for retailers. You know, I do think that um, there's a certain set of enterprises that still think of uh, infrastructure as that black box that sits in a closet somewhere uh, and gets set up once and then you sort of, uh, uh, you know, you don't need to pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, and certainly the modern retail enterprise, the retailer that's aspiring to be the connected store, for instance, um, you know, nothing can be further from the truth. It really is a, a strategic asset. Retail infrastructure is a strategic asset, um, something that needs, needs strategic investment. Uh, and I think though the retail, the, the enterprises that realize that and uh, treat it in that way uh, are a step ahead. So I hope I've set the table uh, for some, uh, some good discussion to follow. Uh, that's why I have uh, Eric, uh, Erica from our perspective. Thank you, Robert. Very interesting information that you just shared. You know, starting from the initial impact of responding in their operations, and I think that's why you, you mentioned the resiliency being right at the top of the list of retailers in their focus is operations must continue. The show must go on. And so I really enjoyed the, the story that you kind of took us through there just to put it all into perspective that they began, a lot of retailers began selling face masks or producing uh, essential needs, PPE type of equipment that wasn't necessarily in their wheelhouse to begin with, but adjusting to the demand of the markets and continuing to provide what was needed was critical, not only for the, the masses, the population that required it, but also for their operations to keep going. Uh, I would love to just open it up to the panel, introduce Mike Leibovitz and Sarah Neslin. Thank you both so much for joining today. I appreciate your time. How are you guys doing? Doing great. Happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, certainly couldn't be better. And you see Sarah's smiling face, so I'm going to return with a big smile as well. <laughs> smiling is contagious. I don't know. That, that word seems like a bad word these days, but uh, it already happens. So, Sarah, my first question goes to you. I want to probe both of your minds and what Robert shared just now. With you being the general manager of retail and transportation at Extreme, you work with a lot of our retail customers, obviously. What have you observed related to the digital maturity of retailers and the vertical impact that they've had and the mitigation of that or the response to it based on that? Yeah, I mean, I think Robert laid it out beautifully. It's exactly what we're seeing out in the field. Um, you have pockets of, of nuggets of gold, you know, and, and generally that's with the retailers that embraced digital transformation going into this. Um, you know, inevitably grocery retailers were going to be, they were going to be up, right? It was essential. They didn't get closed down. But the grocery retailers that embraced digital transformation and are more innovative in nature in their DNA are up big time, like 30s to 40s to 50% increases on revenue. And it's because they attract the masses. Um, on the flip side, the specialty retailers that um, didn't embrace digital transformation, you know, specialty retailers were down anyways, right? They were closed, they were shuttered until they shift and adjust and, and move a lot of the business um, into the e-commerce land. But those that didn't embrace digital transformation going in or down big time. So the, the exact same thing that helped on the, on the essential retailers is the exact same thing that really, really impacted the specialty retailers. And, you know, I think what COVID did for us is really blast us into a time warp. I think we landed somewhere around the 60s or the 70s where life became a little more simple, right? And yeah, it, 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 family matters, right? Time spent connecting with people matter. Now we have to connect this way over the ethernet um, and find new ways to do that. And you'll see in those simpler times, even some of the retailers that, you know, you talked about HEB being um, really prepared for this. And although nobody predicted the toilet paper 
you know, challenges that we had in having multiple supply chain um, areas to go to to supplement. Instead, we had to alter with different processes or how are we going to open it up? How are we going to allow people to, you know, how much were they going to be able to acquire at one time? But, you know, there's an interesting use case that uh, just recently happened with one of the bigs. It was, it was a Walmart. And I think it's a use case that really plays well with big box in general. Because think about big box. What do they have? They have space. They have parking, generally speaking. They have, um, you know, all-in-one shopping experiences. And recently, Walmart um, unveiled their theaters, their drive-in theaters. And we were talking about this, about one of the things that's missing is drive-in theaters. And so I thought this was a brilliant move because now if you think about it, we're spending a lot of time with our family, which is great on one hand, but we're also spending a lot of time with our family in one confined space. And so to be able to take, you know, an excursion out that's safe, it's our little home, you know, it's our own car or truck or what have you, to go out with family, we order our concessions right there, pick them up, you know, from our mobile applications. Um, even if, let's say, you forgot a chair or you want an extra pillow, you can get it right at the storefront. And so I think, you know, having those experiences to get out, have them be safe, and leveraging the technology that's been here for a while, but putting it all together in a new and a unique experiential retail. Those are the kind of things that are going to amplify retail and get us back to, you know, a better new normal. Couldn't agree more. And very well said about, yes, on one hand, we're spending time with family, which is lovely. But we're also spending time with family in a confined space. I love that. Just perfectly said. I mean, and I think that to your point about Walmart, what a, what a fantastic example about how they're applying not only the 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 services that they have in, inside of the store by you know, taking safety precautions and whatnot, um, and the, the standard operations for continuing to deliver those goods to the consumer, but also being creative with your space. How are you, how are you engaging with your, with your customers? To Robert's point during his presentation, as he talked about the shifts <laughs> of selling face masks. We saw a lot of clothing retailers create their own designs and mm -hmm. get creative about how to engage with the with the hottest demand at the time. But I like how Walmart is also saying, okay, people have been cooped up for a long time. How do we safely enable them to come out of their homes and engage in an activity where traditionally that would have never been a use case for Walmart to offer drive-in movies, right? But it seems like such a fitting example of leveraging the space to meet demands that are there today, whatever they might be, being as creative as you can. Mike, we talked about, or Robert talked about the mid, some of the midterm focuses being about the network and what we do to enable those digital trends that we see across the retailers today. But how they're applying the technology is very critical. How do you see retailers applying uh, or leveraging the network to apply uh, and, and enable digital use case trends like what Walmart's doing and so many others. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from any negative comments about spending too much time with my family. <laughs> There's certainly certainly a silver a silver lining with everything. So I think we we can all appreciate uh, more time, especially for busy professionals like all, all of ourselves. But you know, it, it is interesting going back to kind of a point that Robert. Uh, made and, and Sarah spoke about as well is, you know, many, many retailers that are finding success or at least being able to thrust forward were previously investing or strategically were thinking about some form of transformation, whether that was operational or experiential. So either on behalf of their business or on behalf of, of the shoppers, the consumers coming. So, so there's, there is somewhat a digital divide right? And it's not too late. It's never too late for those that haven't started strategically moving in that direction. But when you talk about networking, really in life in, in general, but certainly in the retail market, it, it really has come very much front and center in terms of an essential part of our life. Uh, and I'm sure everybody watching, whether they're spending time at home or, or you know, trying to do work anywhere else, you know, Wi-Fi and, and the network internet some would say cloud connectivity is critical and crucial to everything that we do. Uh, retailers that 
have invested to upgrade their store infrastructure or even their back ends, uh, their, their, their warehousing and distribution channel, those, those systems are, are certainly in a better place to go forward. Without any question, uh, connectivity is, is the lifeblood, right? With, without it, uh, your, your business will, will halt, just like not having uh, fuel in your car. And so those that have started to invest, those that have started to upgrade that are using next generation technologies are in the right position to connect or interconnect new types of devices, new things that are starting to show up either for health and safety reasons or for experience reasons. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but certainly network is, is front and center right now, the, the lifeline for any retailer to help kind of move themselves out of, out of the, the COVID-19 Scenario. Absolutely. I, I love how Robert put it and, and yourself, the analogy to gasoline, right? You don't have gas in your car, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And to Robert's, um, you know, quoting Robert here, he, he mentioned that the network is really the nerve central of your operations in retail and for that matter, any industry. I don't think either any of us can really imagine a day fully unconnected unless you're just going to the mountains or something, but that's not our day to day. So when it comes to the midterm focus areas that he talked about, you know, some of that was agile work environments. And of course, the safety precautions of, of the, the staff and the guests that you have in the stores. But, you know, there's another area you talked about. He, he mentioned uh, supply chain being further down in that midterm focus. And all of these things go back to the network. So to your point, these are the, this is the foundational layer that's going to enable those use cases to be, be, you know, manifest and come to flourishion for them. So Robert, I have a question for you just as a follow-up of what you shared. I know you touched on a lot of those, the, those pillars, the main points. Um, mm -hmm. One area I want to dive into just a little bit more is the supply chain, because as you mentioned, when we have to look at producing new things, uh, new types of, of product for, and sell new, new types of product that were traditionally not in the portfolio of, the, of said retailer, or maybe increase the the shelf, the uh, you know what's on the shelf for mm -hmm. different types of essential needs like toilet paper. Nobody did expect that, Sarah. That was terrible. But Robert, from a supply chain perspective, how did that trickle into you know the the supply chain from the the suppliers that they use, or if they manufacture their own products into the store? What kind of impact did that have? Well, again, we've seen a lot of supply chain disruption, right? It, it's always curious to me that as long as I've been an analyst, we've talked about supply chain visibility, uh, right? It's always been an issue. Uh, and now it's become much more complicated for, uh, for retailers because now they're trying to converge their operation. They're trying to have both a physical store as well as, as, well as an online presence. So uh, I think the, a couple of big impacts are supply chain visibility. And then I think also uh, fulfillment, right? Uh, fulfillment's become much more challenging uh, for, for stores. And we've seen during this crisis, um, retailers having to, having to get a lot more creative about fulfillment, uh, set up curbside delivery, really try and if they weren't already uh, offering a full suite of omni-channel services, they've, had to, they've really had to sort of expand that and, uh, uh, and really um, do whatever they could to deliver goods to the customers. And yet, I think we've all seen challenges, right? Uh, getting what we need when we need it. Even Amazon has struggled um, to deliver things, right? Everything has been stressed. So I think what we're really seeing, uh, Erica, is a lot of supply chain stress now. As we've talked about the use cases of, of that digital maturity, how they've applied it to shift, what are the technology trends you know, specifically for retailers that are applying the adoption of digital transformation to shape you know, the customer experience? Mike mentioned earlier safety. When you, what, what can the customer expect when they walk into a store or should they, when they leverage any omni-channel experience that the retailers are providing, what does that look like going into the future? You know, one of the big trends is the connected store, right? Retailers are aspiring to be the connected store. So that means that, um, that uh, you know, the store experience has to be even more frictionless. It has to be, uh, you know, connected through the entire uh, customer journey, uh, and retailers have been struggling with that, right? Um, that's certainly a driver for digital transformation. This idea that uh, you, you can connect to your customer at any time, your customer can, can connect to you. Also this idea, and I haven't talked enough about this, 
um, that you're utilizing the, all the data that's available to you, right? And in order to do that, you really need to be the connected store. You need to be able to take uh, data from every customer touch point. You need to be able to take data from uh, IoT, your IoT devices, uh, which increasingly are gonna be both on the IT side of a, a retail enterprise, as well as on the OT side. Uh, so you, there's much more data than ever before um, that retailers uh, can optimize in order to deliver that customer experience. Certainly through this crisis, right? I think there's a lot of retailers that said, boy, if, you know, how much more agile could we have been if we had, uh, if we were alleging more, leveraging more of the cloud? Sarah, my question for you related to the technology trends for digital acceleration is really around what are the retailers um, that, what should they be thinking about in their digital competencies related to their size of operations and their location and, you know, the type of, of services that they provide and products that they provide? Yeah, I think, I think it becomes about the ecosystem and particularly for smaller mid-sized retailers that maybe don't have all the resources at their fingertips, the ecosystem matters, right, for agility. Um, something that Robert was talking about that I think is a new thing for us is around disaster recovery for a supply chain. It's not a new concept, but the way that we applied it when we think, well, we should have, you know, two or three or multiple suppliers, but a lot of times they came out of the same geographical region. And so now you're thinking about disaster recovery in multiple layers, right, in geo. If Mexico was shutting down and China was shutting down, where were we in Europe? You know, and those kind of things um, are, are areas that we're gonna give more thoughtfulness to. But when we go back to the ecosystem, I mean, a lot of it really, if you start at the very bottom of everything, foundational, it's the DNA. And I have to come back to kind of the philosophies of a company and the willingness and the agility uh, versus the counter that, you know, you still have vendors out there that like to lock people up in straitjackets. And it's very hard to move. And I think as retailers start to think about their next gen infrastructure, modernizing their infrastructure, you have to look at the companies that you're working with and really the DNA that, that and, and the way that they're innovative or the way that they you know, enable you or the, the counter of that. Um, so when you think about that, right, I, I like to say we live in a, we like the as a service models. You know, we, we actually live in life as a service, right? So offers are coming, we'll call it last, you know, offers are coming fast and furious. And so what it means for the retailers is that you have to have an open framework. You have to be agile in how you uh, work, have accessibility policies. You have to be able to change policies very quickly um, for those that have the authority to do that. And ultimately, Erica, you talked about automation. Automation is going to be king. How do you serve up these new services? You know, contactless shopping. I got to go back to the 60s again. We're in the Jensen era. The new frontier is literally at our house. And so, you know, when you think about crazy ideas of what's coming, I could see Wi-Fi being sponsored by retailers. Now you're in a home front. And think about the platform for really engaging and giving you a personalized experience. Um, that won't surprise me, right? But of course, we talked about AI and being able to handle vast amount of data. It depends on where you're at. How fast do you have to handle it? You have to handle it fast when I'm home, you know, shopping. And for our friends in Boston, you have to handle it wicked fast when you're in the store. And so having you know, data centers out at the edge that can talk to the cloud and do some very quick analytics is going to be important. You know, Mike talked about connectivity, analytics, obviously, and then the ability to crunch offers and have new offers or crunch data and have new offers spun up as fast as possible is going to be critical to enabling us to live our life as a service how we want to live it on the edge. As a service seems to be the theme of, of everything these days, right? And you're absolutely right. We want what we want when we want it on demand, personalized, customized, or it doesn't resonate. And there's a lot of white noise out there. So retailers are definitely fighting that battle of how to connect and engage, but also with hyper relevancy 
Mike, they talked so much, Robert and Sarah, about these, these digital use cases to the tech trends that are happening inside of the store, outside of the store, frictionless experience, IoT in the store, all these things. Obviously, the network is going to play a huge role in supporting this. So when it comes to, say, occupancy management inside of a store and contact tracing capabilities or even um, digital touch points to remove and, or minimize risk, uh, where we can, how does the network play a role in that? What ha has to happen inside of the store? I mean, I think I think overall, you know, network and, and the IT team is strategic uh, and perhaps some that have embarked on digital transformation journeys, you know, view the IT team as a strategic entity and that the investments being made are, are completely strategic to the, the outcome of, of the business. Um, there, there's no question that uh, you know, IT and, and network, when you start talking about data, when you start talking about analytics, when you talk about locationing technologies, you know, cloud, all of these things, the IT team should be at the forefront of those conversations and, and working with or bringing their organization to those technologies to help transform. Um, without, without the technology in the store, at the storefront, uh, you know, I think we've talked about it a few times or, or perhaps we mentioned it, but, um, you know, a lot of stores will go undergo physical transformation. Some might be resizing, right? Some might become growing or shrinking or just completely changing. If you think of a front of store where, you know, contactless or, or you know, self-checkout systems are, are going to become much more normal. Than, than perhaps uh, you may have, have thought or be thinking about it. You know, to transform your store uh, and connect devices, everything will have an IP address on it. So it's not just IoT sensors for temperature control um, for your food product, if you're a grocer, it could be IoT sensors for temperature control of shoppers that are entering your store as well. So the placement of these devices will be everywhere. Though they will rely on Wi-Fi predominantly, they might re rely on your wired switching infrastructure, but all of these things come together and they, they must be agile, it must be simple, it must be effortless, it must be quick to make these changes or implement in the store or you know, you're, you're, you're fighting a losing battle. Yeah, I, I think uh, I couldn't have said it better, obviously. I think, I think that there's a paradigm shift happening, not only with how the network infrastructure is being uh, deployed and designed, which I want to ask you about that next, but also a paradigm shift in IT support within an organization going from tactical to very strategic, where it's, it's very much a part of the front line. It's now a part of the discussion, uh, not an optional discussion to how do we innovate, how do we adopt digital transformation as, as it was before in isolated pockets of the business, but now it seems to be very strategic and necessary to have IT a part of those discussions right out of the gate and applied not to an isolated pocket of their store environment or, or KPI, but to the entire operations all at once. And I think that's very interesting to see that shift in that relationship between IT and operations. Related to the paradigm shifts of the design though, what you're talking about uh, really requires what all that data, insights, the analytics, the automation, the support of distributed environments and a, a distributed network, what kind of paradigm shifts should they be looking at from an IT consideration perspective in their design? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it goes, it goes back to the use cases, right? What are you going to foresee in the store? I think there's, there's probably a lot of people out there, perhaps people watching us that, are, you know, jump to the conclusion that physical or brick and mortar retails, uh, you know, will go away. And uh, I, I would say simply stated, there's, there's really no truth to that. Certainly online shopping is convenient and has seen record growth in the last number of months. Um, but there, there's something to be said about physical retail and why shoppers go into stores in the first place. It's for many shopping online is challenging depending on what you're trying to buy. Clothing for a lot of people is hard to buy online. They wanna be able to try it on or see themselves in the clothes. Um, different types of equipment uh, you may want to see or touch. And so, you know, some of the use cases you start to think about that lead you back to connectivity uh, and perhaps things like augmented reality, 
right? So how does somebody come into a store and try on clothes? Can the next shopper try on the same clothes? Well, maybe you start seeing uh, an increase of digital mirrors, right? Where people can come in the store, see how they might look in a particular shirt. Maybe it's a nice kind of pinkish red shirt. They think they look good and then they can buy that shirt and away they go. Um, you know, I've, I've read use cases, for example, in sporting equipment. Uh, I want to buy a tent, but I can't visually think how big is this tent that's 10 by 10. If I walk into a sporting goods store and I have a mobile device and I can select it and actually display it on the floor, I can get a very good sense in, in the real world of what that tent might look like before I buy it. And so all of these use cases, you know, augmented reality uh, is a great example, more bandwidth, more data, more consumption. You need a network to support that. If you have a 10 year old network or even older than that in your store today, you're gonna struggle to be able to support those types of use cases. So all of it comes back to the intended use cases. Brick and mortar doesn't go away. IT becomes far more strategic and all these things fuse together really to accelerate, I I think the experiential side of shopping to, to bring people back safely and mm -hmm. offer new experiences in the store. But you, you made some good points though, uh, very interesting concepts and exciting from a, cons uh, from a consumer perspective, but the network visibility from that end, whatever the storefront is, whatever the uh, scale of those locations are, it's all going to require, even if it's just one store, there's massive visibility that you need. And it seems to lend towards a paradigm shift of more cloud adoption, how yes. we design for our networks. Like Robert was saying, retail's traditionally been slow to adopt cloud. Do you see that they would be adopting more con uh, concepts like cloud for their I mean, the co network designs? Yeah, the, co the concept of, of agility, being able to move fast and adapt uh, and change, some would say flexibility. I mean, that is purely cloud driven. If you say it a different way, without the cloud, uh, you're, you're, you're going to struggle. You're going to be in sort of a legacy mode, uh, very heavy, right? Things are going to be very heavy around you physically and logically how you try to configure your store. And so cloud is absolutely at the forefront of, of any new architecture, not just network, compute and storage. I mean, which have, have traditionally been cloudified or have been cloudified some time ago. Network technology is in the process and in many ways has come very far along in terms of cloudification. And so cloud is really at the forefront of all conversations around agility, speed, flexibility, simplicity, um, almost so much so that it doesn't even come off the top of my mind. It's just sort of ingrained that yeah. cloud is, is the option. I couldn't agree more, not only for the use cases you, you described in the store as an example, but also the IT personnel, the safety of, of the staff. Uh, I, I've you know, heard so many organizations that they require, if you can be remote, be remote. This is safer for, for everybody else. If we don't have these central locations, hubs for, for them to go into I, the IT teams and support these environments, that makes it not only more flexible, uh, more cost efficient, operationally agile, but also uh, it lends towards safety as well. But Robert, I want to ask you a question as well related to the mm -hmm. IT uh, considerations that need to happen within retail. How do they need to be aligned with the elevated new demands today for the business operations resiliency. We touched on it a little bit with, with Mike. He went into some detail about how cloud is a big component of that. But as Sarah mentioned, that the resiliency of your operations, the disaster recovery aspects of that, being able to um, reduce any single point of failure, how can IT be aligned to elevate that and minimize the risk of another single point of failure for the next big wave of change we experience? So for us, it really starts with the use case, right? I think retailers have to say, um, you have to look at their enterprise, identify the gaps and where they can apply digital transformation. Um, and I think they need to um, you know, raise that up from being a, a local tactical effort to being a, a, a visible strategic effort from the enterprise saying, here's our, here's our opportunities, um, here's where we should be applying digital transformation, here are the use cases, and, and then from that, they can identify the technologies needed, the retail infrastructure that's needed. Uh, and more recently, um, we've really talked more and more about the need for a strong uh, infrastructure foundation to digital transformation. 
So of course it's network, right? Um, but we also see retailers doing things like edge and, and virtualization and, uh, and putting in IoT and, and using artificial intelligence uh, more fully across the enterprise. Uh, and now we're looking at 5G coming down and, and that having a lot of advantages. So, you know, I think there's a lot that comes under that umbrella of retail infrastructure foundation. Network is key. Um, software defined networking we see coming, uh, coming on fast. And, and certainly a component of that coming on very fast is SD-WAN. So, you know, there's things like that that retailers really need to um, use to, to support their digital transformation efforts. And I think Mike touched on this, right? Um, I think that trying to do these, um, uh, these things that help create a better uh, customer experience uh, on old technology and an old foundation um, is, is not a good bet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, our world changes rapidly in every parts of our lives. So, you know, we're not designing networks for the 60s, as Sarah has been referencing, but we are designing networks for not only today, we should be thinking about designing networks for the future state as well. And that doesn't mean that we know exactly what that will be, but it means that our infrastructure needs to be agile enough to respond with that change, to be able to uh, meet the demands in real time or near real time so that the retailers can stay competitive and maintain their relevancy amongst their, their customer base, right? Um, adapt to changes and in, in, in innovation as they come and they most definitely will. I think that's the only certain thing we have is knowing that change is absolutely going to happen. So, you know, as we wrap up what we've been talking about, I'd love to kind of shift gears a little bit into, well, the shifting landscape in retail. You guys talked about the, the focus areas and the ecosystem, the supply chain, the customer experience, all these things. How will this change the competitive landscape amongst those retailers? Sarah, I'm, I'm gonna pass this one to you. Yeah, I think the lines are gonna continue to blur. You know, ultimately we're after blending physical and digital experiences together. And Erica, you said it best. I mean, the, the customer is a little bit um, temperamental, right? We want what we want when we want it. And tomorrow it might be a little bit different. And you know, some of the North Stars that Robert talked about with contactless <clears throat> shopping or frictionless shopping, I think are areas to embrace. Look, right now we don't want to touch anything. You know, I, I could just blink my gas into my car, you know, or I dream a genie. It might just have my, my cart start to move along with me. I think there's going to be some amazing innovations that come of this. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I would look at someone like a Lululemon. There's a specialty retailer for you that just got real with their latest purchase of Mir. And that is a marketer's platform dream. If you think about it, if, if the new frontier is your home, we're spending an awful lot of time in it. And yet COVID has also had us really conscious about health. And these things come together in a tremendous um, offering to you know, the user. So not only do I get to work out with hot new content that comes up and it changes continually, uh, my gym is closing and coming back up and then closing and coming back open, so it's not reliable. And so this is a reliable thing that is connected in to Wi-Fi, out to the internet, likely to the cloud, all the things that we've discussed. But think about it. This gives Lululemon the ability to launch new products right to you that they know what I look like as I'm looking at this mirror. They know exactly what I look like, what I buy, what I, my preferences are, how hard do I actually work out, you know, and, and those kind of things coming together. I mean, the use cases go on and on for them. And I think we're going to see those type of situations become more and more frequent just based on the landscape that we're in. So I, I predict that, you know, omni experiential retail will reign supreme and, you know, watch this place here. And it takes it that's you're talking about consolidation. That's a competitive shift as well, right? I mean, the, the Amazon, uh, Amazon was king when it comes to online purchases, but during the, the initial impact, we actually noticed that 
other retailers had the opportunity to step up their online presence and had more traction than they had had before because Amazon was was prioritizing essential needs, right? And uh, as it relates to what you're saying, first of all, Mare, wow, I wanted it before, now I really want it. That sounds so cool. And I love that when Lululemon purchasing Mare, that means that the data points that they have, the the ability to be hyper relevant back to the customer is far beyond anything that we've experienced before. Um, it's, it's, it's getting on the level of Google and you know things like that where they really understand their buyer journey. They really understand what they want. And I, I do see that continuing to shape uh, un- unforeseen aspects of that competitive landscape, who, who the incumbents are and, and who, they, um, who they knock off, who they become, right? What, what smaller chains that were born into innovation will grow from this uh, at, at this time. And it's gonna be interesting to see that unfold over time. Uh, related to the buyer journey, sorry, Sarah. I was just gonna throw one thing in there. If you think about, Robert mentioned this as well, giving back to the employees or finding new ways for them to adapt. The employees, I mean, Mirror, the founder of Mirror was a Lululemon ambassador. So she understood you know, the brand, the brand experience, what they're trying to do with um, their clientele and Lululemon first funded and then purchased. And if you think about that, you know, it's, it's exciting as employees that you're on the inside thinking about a new concept. Maybe you step out into the outside world. Yeah, that's absolutely true. It, it ignites the entrepreneurial spirit all over again. I feel like there's the, the barrier to entry because of technology becoming more and more accessible with cloud technology. I mean, really, that is that was the start of being able to make these quick shifts, be, be born into a, a innovation and agility to start a new business by adopting the network uh, t- types of trends that are around cloud automation, IoT, where it's an as a service model. You don't have to be an expert or have a huge uh, you know, data center somewhere, it's getting the customers out of data center, out of the data center business and putting them back into their core competency, freeing up the creative mind space for ambassadors like the, the ambassador of Lululemon to innovate and expand her horizons through entrepreneurial goals that really changes the customer buying experience. Robert, related to the buying journey though, you know, what she was talking about, uh, if I were the customer and I'm using Mayor and I'm working out, Lululemon's able to um, advertise certain outfits for me, uh, know what my habits are, know when I'm working out, what type of workouts am I doing so that they can position different products for me. That's obviously gonna change the buyer journey where I could just click add to cart, it has my information and I'm done. So I'm curious, how do you foresee the buyer journey evolving in the future state of retail as we move from the tactical responses to the long-term strategy and application of the technology? Well, you know, I think what we've been seeing in, the, in this uh, COVID crisis is probably a hint of things to come, right? A uh, huge shift online. Uh, and, uh, and so I think, you know, buyers who are customers who have been buying things online they haven't bought before, right, have become accustomed to this. So I think that's going to create a huge shift, right? Uh, and I think we're all still sort of trying to figure out how much of this new uh, consumer behavior is sticky uh, and how much of it, how much it stays. Um, you know, I do think that, that there's um, a lot of innovation going on. And I think we as consumers uh, are going to start to migrate to those um, retailers that are doing more innovation. Um, there's a spot here in Boston uh, called um, uh, the Seaport uh, area, the Seaport shopping area. Um, which has been talked about everywhere and every major magazine has talked about uh, this new innovation district in Boston for retail. Uh, and, um, y- you know, they've turned these spots over. It's like a modular store um, that looks like it could have been brought in on the back of a flatbed truck. Uh, little stores that fit five or six customers in uh, maximum, even if there weren't any restrictions. They turn the stores over very quickly. And just as one example, Glossier, the online cosmetic store, was set up in one of these modular stores. Um, in fact, they gave them about four of the stores that wrap around a corner. Uh, there was a makeup module. You could go in that store for makeup. There was a perfume. Or there was an eyebrow uh, uh, module, I think. Uh, and I was amazed when I went down there one weekend. And the line um, 
must have been 50 or 75 people long. People were waiting around the corner. It was innovative. And here was an online retailer that plopped down a physical store for a period of time. They knew that they were going to be, you know, they were going to leave in about uh, eight weeks or something. But think about the takeaway brand recognition and all the people that went to this pop-up store and now, you know, are shopping online. So I think the pop-up thing um, and the innovation just draws people in. And maybe the scarcity factor too, the fact that this online retailer was here at a store for eight weeks and then was going to be gone. Everybody knew that. So it's, you know, the scarcity factor. Uh, so I think we're, you know, it's an innovation thing that I think is going to uh, grab consumers. And I like it when I've heard my fellow panelists talking about um, augmented reality and virtual reality, because I think the nature of the immersive um, customer experience is going to change, right? Yeah, to your point, those pop-up stores, that absolutely changes the buyer journey because how do they know, how do they become aware that those pop-up stores will be there? I'm sure they're leveraging social media. So the, that awareness stage is starting in different areas and, and uh, multimedia platforms than they were before, where, where we're not relying on solely on email or waiting for those, those uh, buyers to come into the store so that they can see the, the sales that are happening that, that week, waiting for an associate to come and tell them what the specials are. We have to engage them and, and aware, help them become aware of you know, our products, the retailers' products in a different way. So mm -hmm. that buyer journey, I definitely see continuing to shift and we will continue to gravitate towards innovation. As we wrap this up, final words, I'm gonna leave to Mike to share with us, you know, quick hitters, bullet points, when it comes to the network and the IT design, what are the top three areas that you would recommend ensuring that you invest in? Cloud we know is one, what are some of the others? Yeah, I think, I think, um... And thanks for wrapping up with me. Uh, I, I think uh, th th there's a few things that, that stand out pretty pretty quickly. And, you know, certainly cloud, you know, data, APIs, location technology, those, those would be some of the tops because we have talked a lot about connectivity. Connectivity is, you know, some would say the plumbing or, or kind of the foundation, but it's what you do on top of that network and, and how you can work from that network. I'll give you an example. And Robert, Robert hit on one. Um, just a, just a brief minute ago of uh, you know showing up at a retail location and being told that you have to wait outside one of our customers very rapidly using our technology using our api's and location technology was able to implement into their mobile app uh, wait times store wait times and be able to direct customers to other stores in nearby area with a shorter wait time and so that really goes back to agility, how quickly, you know, it's a brand new problem. So the customer never had a problem such as this before, right? They never had to keep people waiting outside to adhere to, you know, a regulation. How quickly can they adapt to the new normal? Now we have our shoppers waiting out line, drops the satisfaction. Perhaps some of the shoppers are going to stay at home or go to a competitor or shop online. Now, very rapidly, we can implement something into our mobile app to improve the experience by saying, hey, wait time at store X is 20 minutes. But if you drive, you know, just five minutes away or 10 minutes to the next location, it's only a two minute wait time. And so it's just an example of where having the agility from cloud and the technologies using APIs, the data that, that are in there, being able to wrap that all together, ultimately making your network and your IT team far more strategic to the outcomes uh, of your organization. And so really that's, that's sort of the top of mind uh, for, from my perspective is being able to solve into those use cases very, very rapidly. Again, using that agile and flexibility term uh, to cap yeah. it off. Yeah, uh, very well said. Uh, perfect summary. And I love that example. You know, Uber was not much different than taxi other than the fact that it removed the uncertainty of wait time. Right. Once we know what we're waiting for, we're, we're more inclined to, to be patient with that experience. But agility, cloud technologies for distributed, flexible operations of how the network is supporting where those operations go. They don't live in one place anymore. They can be anywhere. They can be pop up. They can be as innovative as our creative minds can dream up. So that's all the time we have for the new normal retail of the future. Thank you all for joining and sharing those insights. I think I, uh, I'm now very excited about as a consumer retail of the future. And also I think I'm going to go buy the mirror. 
Sarah, great idea. Thank you guys. I hope you have a great day. And for those of you watching, unfortunately, we do not have time for Q&A, but do remember that the resources for the presentations that were shared earlier today uh, in the webinar are gonna be available for you. Also, the webinar is, is recorded and will be sent to you within a couple of days. Have a great day, everyone.